uh, enjoyment. You will get some benefit out of it. I surely will take away a lot of plus points. Uh, I will uh, like to mention before I start with the book that uh, I both me and my wife have been born and brought up in the state of JNK and we have been witness to the varying degrees of turbulence in the state from the very beginning. Starting with the invasion, thereafter the accession, and thereafter the Shama Prashad Mukherjee agitation in 1953, which was in protest to the 1951 constitution of JNK, which had been drawn up, where the chief minister had been given the status of uh, prime minister and the flag was also given to the state government as a separate flag in addition to the national flag. Uh, thereafter, we move on. And he had given a slogan of Ek Desh, Ek Vidhan, Ek Nishan. So that was a very popular uh, agitation in the Jammu part. And it went on for quite some time. Unfortunately, uh, Shama Prashad Mukherjee uh, died in 53 towards the end. And there are many theories about his death. I will also like to mention here that this book is not really a reflection of my childhood impressions, but is a dispassionate outcome of my experience and learning in varying positions in the army at senior levels. It's already been mentioned that during the Kargil war, I was a DGMO. And that time, the insurgency was also at its peak. And uh, then subsequently, the Jash Bomber attack took place on the parliament. And we had Aprakram. And uh, the thirdly, uh, the, when I became the chief, that time also the insurgency was at its peak. But this learning didn't end here. Uh, fortunately for me, after I superannuated from the army, I joined the National Disaster Management Authority. And most of you have been involved. Uh, especially like uh, Mr. Abibullah, who was here and who was in JNK at that time. And like uh, Sri Mehta mentioned, the Kashmir earthquake took place. And uh, in that, uh, just one second. Authority had a lot to do with uh, the earthquake reconstruction. And thereafter, I joined the Vivekananda International Foundation and the think tanks, as you know, that they have a lot to do with the uh, these kinds of discussions. Oh, can you hear me all right? Yes, sir, can we can you? hear you. Oh, we can okay. hear you. Okay, there's some, all right, fine. Uh, but your, uh, your yeah, that, uh, camera I don't know why it is. Camera, yeah, yeah okay. it's okay now. No, no, I, I think it has to be uh, rotated. I think it needs to be rotated uh, so that we can see you properly. Otherwise, it's uh, uh, coming vertical. Yeah.
Yeah. It's okay now. It's okay. Yeah, it's okay. I'm not holding that man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It's fine. It's fine. Now, okay. Now, uh, what I like to mention is that uh, after uh, these experiences, now before I get down to the proper okay, presentation, fine. I like to mention four points which have a lot of relevance with the subsequent developments in the state. Uh, and those four points are, number one, the accession instrument which was signed by Maharaja Hari Singh was the same as signed by the other princely states. And it gave two points very categorically. And that was, one, that state will be an integral part of India. And number two, that its process is irreversible. Uh, of, of course, at this time, that constitution was also drawn up. And that also mentioned that there will be, uh, Kashmir will be an integral part of India. That is, JNK will be an integral part of India. So that point, there were no doubt. But they were given certain special concessions. And that was the introduction of Article 370 and 35A, which remained a bone of contention for a very long time. Now, because of that, uh, the, there was a lot of... Uh, sort of unhappiness in some parts of the state. And the other part was, of course, Kashmir part was very much okay with it. Uh, Mr. Nehru mentioned immediately after that, that this is a temporary and a transient phase, and it will get worn out with the passage of time. And when Indira Gandhi became the prime minister, and in 75, she had an accord with Sheikh Abdullah for return to power, uh, she diluted this. Article 370 and 35A very much, and many more restrictions were brought in. And India, government of India, got a lot of authority in uh, formulating the various form, uh, rules and regulations in this particular part. Now, this is number one. Number two is the state of JNK is a multilingual, multi regional, multi ethnic, multi religious state. It was never a single co coherent uh, entity and a unit. And in that, the issue was that the non-Muslim part of the state were very unhappy that they were not getting the fair deal. And they felt that uh, the Muslims were taking away most of the uh, advantages and all the education institutions and others were filled with their boys and also the governmental jobs were given to them rather than to the non-Muslim people. As you know, the state has three main communities. One is the Dogras, the second is the Muslims, and third are the Ladakhis. So that is one part. Number two, three, I will uh, like to mention is that uh, when we joined the army in 62, I joined uh, in uh, a lower division in the 62 war, and uh, that time, as young officers, we were told that a strong and stable Pakistan is in the interest of India. So we believed for quite some time to come, till the time the war started. And uh, later on, uh, I found that uh, whereas India had moved off from the partition and was on to the other path of trying to develop the state, the Kashmiri, the Pakistanis were still in the existential fear. They were living in their existential fear. That was uh, their problem. And I'll give you an anecdote in this, uh, which will give you an idea of their thought process. When I was uh, the DGMO and uh, during the Kargil War, we had an interaction with the DGMO of Pakistan and Hassa, which is a, a border state next to uh, Amritsar, uh, there, uh, during the meeting, I told the General Tokizia, who was the DMO, that I have brought photographs and videos of uh, the Pakistani soldiers who had died in Kashmir during the particular operation. And he said, no, no, these are not our uh, people. We, I am not interested in them. So then I told him, I said, look, then what are we meeting here for? Because if we had to coordinate the withdrawal of your remaining militants, that was the purpose of the meeting. And you don't know them. 
and you don't know who they are, then how will you control that? But anyway, he didn't reply and the meeting went on. And during the tea break, he took me to one side and said that uh, sab kyun kar rahe hai? Ab de ji, aapko bhi hai sach kya hai. And he was trying to give it to him. But what I want to say is that Pakistanis will always remain in a state of denial. And that is their problem. And number two, also I must mention that in 1999, Mr. Bajpayee had taken a famous bus yatra to Lahore in pursuance of peace. And while he was in Pakistan, that was the time the Pakistani soldiers were moving into Kargil and trying to occupy those posts which we used to vacate during the winter because that was an area with large gaps and all that. There was hardly any activity in that area. Now, that is the degree of their deceit. So how much can you trust them? That is the problem area. And last point I will like to mention, and this, that is the fourth point, that uh, Pakistan always believed that because Kashmir is a Muslim predominant state, the pa Kashmir must belong to them. But for India, religion is not the driving force. We are a secular country. And for us, it is to prove a point that in India, the Muslims and Hindus and the other minorities all live together harmoniously and in peace. But Mr. Bhutto at that time said, if a Muslim predominant state cannot be part of India, then what is the reason that of Pakistan being there? There's no advantage of Pakistan being there. Anyway, these are the four points which I thought I'll mention. Now I'll move on to the rest of the things. Number one, very briefly, what is the strategic importance of JNK? Firstly, it is the confluence of the three major religions, that is the Hinduism, uh, the Islam, and the Buddhism. The area of UK and Gilgit Pakistan give Pakistan the advantage of having a common border with Afghanistan, number one, number two with China, and number three, they also give them a look into the areas of Central Asian republics and approach to them. So it is a very important area for us. That's why POK and Gilgit Baltis are for us are important because Pakistan is now, because of the changed circumstances, is blessed with the geographical advantage. All right. I now come on to the 61, 65 war and 70 war. What I like to mention is that most of the people believe that because most of the people believe that whatever we gained in the wars, in the battlefield, we lost the advantage in the negotiating areas and negotiating times. And that is like in 65, we returned the uh, Hazipir Pass to them. In 71, 71 war, in similar agreement in 72, uh, we returned the 95,000 prisoners and 5,000 square kilometers of the area which we had captured during the operations. Now, the point is, many people felt that that was done, then we should have taken advantage of that and the line of control should have been converted to the international border and this problem should have been settled once for all. But it was not done. It was not done because Mrs. Indira Gandhi felt that her own cabinet perhaps will not accept this point. They will like to have Gilgit and Pakistan and rather than only settling and converting this to the area of uh, uh, international border, the line of control. So for that reason, but that is one of the theories which is believed. Now what really exactly is the reality one cannot say, but I have written in the book a lot on the Shimla agreement and the way the proceedings went about. So one can draw one's own conclusion. Uh, you come now to the post-71 uh, situation and the trauma with Pakistan felt. Pakistan came to the three conclusions very clearly that they cannot beat India in a conventional war. That is very clear. 
they were also convinced that they have no option but to develop nuclear capability. Only then they could be able to compete with India. And for that, Bhutto said that we will do that even if we have to eat grass. The number three thing is Pakistan and China came still more closer to each other. And uh, Pakistan also got advantage of getting weapon systems from China. So these were the impact of the 71 war on Pakistan internally. Now, as far as uh, Kashmir is concerned, the moment the Afghan war was over, their focus turned towards OPTOPAC. And that was an OPTOPAC was the uh, operation which was there to start the insurgency in JNK. Now, Pakistan has had the advantage of running the Punjab insurgency for good about over 15 years. And that had taught them a lot as to how to handle an insurgency. And as a result, uh, when the uh, it, Punjab operation really became a precursor to the Kashmir in, insurgency. And three things came out of that. Firstly, with OPTOPAC as it started, the militancy came to stay in JNK for good, number one. Number two, there was an ethnic cleansing in which the four lakh Kashmiris had to leave the valley and migrate to Jammu and other areas in India. And number three, uh, which is uh, also equally important, as a matter of fact, the most important factor which has become today is that the state got more and more radicalized and the Sufism uh, and uh, moderation was snuffed out of the state. Now, that is what was the situation. Thereafter, we come to the long period of insurgency starting from 89 to the present as it is going on. And there is no hope of end in sight in the immediate future. Ultimately, of course, it will come through. Now, I would like to mention that from 89 to 99, the insurgency was up and down in various swings. In 99, Pakistan has felt that the insurgency needs to be given a momentum and they planned the Kargil operation. Now, I'll be very limited. I'll do a limited talking on Kargil operation. Only three, four aspects I'd like to mention. Their idea was that if they occupy the Kargil Heights, then India will be forced to move troops out of the valley and take on the Pakistanis who are in Kargil area and who have come and occupied the various uh, positions. Now, the video is gone, but should I carry on? Hello? Please go ahead. Okay, Good. right. Now, now, no, no, it's come up. now it's come up. Okay. Now, the next point was, they felt that this will create a vacuum in Kashmir, in the valley, and that will enable them to uh, occupy the valley in a big way. That was their plan. Uh, but they didn't realize that the Indians will react very fast. And what we did was that we moved a division which was located in the valley to the Kargil sector and brought in a division from the central India immediately. The moment on 5th of May, we discovered that there were some biveks on the hill features in Kargil. We realized that it cannot be the normal uh, insurgency. It has got to be something much beyond that. And that time the move was ordered. And they moved along both the axes, along the Patan Kot axis and through the Manali axis. And they were located in Kashmir as a threat in being should India had to carry out an operation inside uh, Pakistan. We also moved the DG Assam uh, DG Rashtri Rifles into the valley to handle the insurgency. And the GOC 15 Gore, who was in Kashmir, was given the sole responsibility of looking after the area of Kargil operations. So that's how we would have planned. And the Kargil operation, as you all know, was a fiasco. And... Uh, it was a big shame for Pakistan. As a matter of fact, their president uh, had to go running. Uh, rather, the prime minister had to go running in Nawaz Sharif to Kashmir, uh, to uh, Washington, to meet President Clinton and request him 
to get Indians to uh, let Pakistanis get out of that area. And that's how the things develop. But more this on the subject of my next book when I as and when I get to write. But for this particular discussion, this is more than enough. Now, thereafter, things carried on till 2016 in various uh, forum, in various forms, up and down. But in 2016, Buran Wani appeared on the scene. And Buran Wani was a very young and a dashing personality who uh, drew the attention of a lot of people. He was also a fanatic. And uh, as a result, four things happened. The insurgency picked up in a big way. Uh, the children uh, of ages between 14 to 18 or so became uh, the commanders. They joined the insurgency and they used to call themselves as commanders. Number two, the women also joined the insurgency. They are feeling that they are losing their children. And number three, the street turbulence and stone pelting became the order of the day. And last but not the least, the police stations were raided in a big way, very, very frequently with a view to snatch weapons. And their idea was also to collect a lot of people there so that the armed forces and the security forces are provoked and they open fire and there is a mayhem in the state. Of course, this went on for quite some time. But in 60, also many other things happened, uh, which showed that the insurgency is now really hotting up once again. Firstly, uh, the insurgents attacked the Udi Brigade at night and 11 people were killed there. Now, that was a big insult to India and uh, the army was given a free hand by the government of India and I must give them full credit for that. And on 29th September, the Indian army launched an uh, attack across the thing and uh, there were four places which were taken and it was a big success and it raised the morale of the uh, country. Also at that time, uh, the Pakistan air base was attacked. Uh, the uh, the Grota uh, core headquarter was uh, attacked and also Saba brigade headquarter was attacked. So all these things happened. All the areas were cleared up, but Pakistanis were getting bolder by the day. And uh, there were more and more security forces inducted to bring the insurgency under control. But in 2019, uh, I think they crossed the threshold of Indian patients when a car loaded with the RDX in Pulwama area banged into a CRPF convoy bus which was coming from Jammu to Srinagar and the 40 people inside that bus died. All of them died. And that was the end of our limit of patience. And the Indian Army Armed Forces rather did what was never expected by anybody. And we launched an attack in the area of Balakot, where our Air Force people went about 80 kilometers deep inside Balakot to attack their training camp. And that was uh, something which the world could believe. But they now realized that this was a new India which was not prepared to allow any country to tinker with its national integrity and its borders. Alongside, government of India came to a conclusion that enough is enough and this system is not going to carry on. And what they had been planning for long, they now got into that. And that brings me to 5th August 2019, where a paradigm shift took place. And where the government felt, as I mentioned earlier, that this flexibility and uh, legacy which has been given to the Kashmiris has kept them in a one unsettled mind. They are still thinking in terms of uh, independence, autonomy, and even as Huryat was propagating, to, join the, to consider the option of joining Pakistan. And they abrogated Article 370 and also Article 35A, both. 
divided the state into two UTs. One was uh, one was Ladakh and Kargil, and Kargil also you know have a big belt of the Muslim population, but mostly Shias, not Sunnis, which are there in the valley. And the second one was Jammu and Kashmir. Now I think uh, the the Ladakh uh, is element or segment didn't have to have a legislature, whereas Jammu and Kashmir want to have a legislature. The government uh, also promised that the statehood will be restored when the things come back to normal. But what is very important, and I think what was very wise, was the action that they combined Jammu and Kashmir into one thing. Jammu is and Kashmir are both very interdependent on each other from all angles, from economy, from their movement, from their infrastructure. And also the fact is that Jammu acted as a glue to keep Kashmir into India. And there were a lot of people who were propagating trifunction of the state, divide them into three bits. But I think what the government did was very wise. And uh, that was very, very useful. Uh, the Pakistanis, of course, were totally taken by surprise, and there was a there was a token retaliation of an air, uh, so-called air attack, where they just came into our area and went back. So that's uh, how things happened. India had done its homework well, and in that, internationally, you found that everybody accepted this as an internal matter of India. Later on, there was some criticism for the internet being kept off for a little longer while, which of course was then subsequently restored and things came back to normal. Inside JNK, now there were a lot of worries and fear that there may be uh, a rebellion, there may be a mass civil disobedience movement, and there may be a lot of insurgency which may pick up. All that didn't happen. As a matter of fact, the Kashmiris were so much taken by surprise and they were so much got into a state of mind of fear because they saw their leaders all being put under house arrest in a moment. And also they found that Pakistan could do nothing for them except for making noise in the international circles. Imran Khan even went to the extent of telling his own parliament, they showed their intent very clearly that they are not going to do anything about it beyond what they were doing. Kashmir also settled down. Odd events keep happening here and there, which will, which will carry on for quite some time to come. And we should not be surprised. The infiltration dropped to very low level. As a matter of fact, uh, I didn't mention this point earlier because this may come up in a question and we can answer that in detail. We had created a fence in 2003, when I was in uh, service and I was the chief, and we finished that by 2004. That was a 740 kilometer long fence starting from the Chinab River to Jozila. But it was not a fence as such, it was a complete system of the early warning system and the electrification and the various other things. And it was an arrangement which didn't allow the infiltration to take place in a big number and gradually the infiltration had dropped over a period of time. So now there were less than 100 people who could infiltrate. Because of this action by the government of India, the local recruitment also, which was going on in a big way, came down uh, substantially. And that's how the things uh, happened. Now that finishes uh, with my part one of the presentation, now I'll come to part two. And there I mentioned a few points which uh, are important and which have a bearing on the other things. But they will be explained very, very briefly. Firstly, the aspect of, uh, and one weakness, that we have fought insurgency for 30 years. But in these 30 years, we've not been able to draw out a policy, a doctrine, and a strategy for JNK. There's no consistency in our system. And there are many organizations uh, working on this. There is an intelligence, of course, they will be there. There's army there. There are paramilitary forces there. There are the Ministry of Defense there. 
uh, all these organization work but that kind of coordination which you want that was perhaps not there so there is a requirement for a single agency to handle this and all others to help them and for that reason now you see the home ministry has taken over the show and they are working on it and the others are supporting them but this must be drawn out immediately and i think it will have to be inter agency multi ministry and also the armed forces involved with this then only we will be on a stable footing second aspect i like to mention is the aspect of perception management now that is a gaping hole in our our entire approach because we find that we've not been able to form formulate a suitable narrative to put across to the kashmiris to tell them what dr mehta had mentioned that they are our people and we believe in them and we trust them and we love them as much as we love everybody else that we've not been able to do of course the army had a project of sadbhavna which worked for over 20 years and did a marvelous work and was very very popular in the valley but this effort needs to be upgraded and it i think the government needs to form a, a commission or an authority uh, which will uh, have as its members some experts technical experts uh, the bureaucrats the say media people the people art film artists and various other and of course the services and they all work together and work on it and this organization i must have an easy access to the government and of course the fund should not be a major restricting a factor third thing i like to come back to and repeat is that kashmiris are our people and i think for that we must remember mr vajpayee's uh, statement we he made in a rally in kashmir in 2003 when he went there and said that we will deal with the kashmir problem in kashmiriyat jamhuriyat and insaniyat and those three words of his left a very lasting impression in the state and as a result uh, the kashmiris even today will quote you the example of mr bajpai that if you approach us this like this if your attitude towards us is like this then we you will find our loyalty to you so, but this is a very important aspect number 4 is that pakistanis keep their terror going in a big way now we must also have some pressure points unfortunately uh, we don't use them but we must have and we must be uh, prepared for using those pressure points like i give you one example in this water treaty if we say that we will withdraw from indus water treaty as a matter of fact the kashmiris are in favor of this and they have also passed a resolution in their assembly in favor of withdrawing the indus water treaty uh, proposal and we also can tell the pakistanis that we will reject the dorin line things of that kind can be done there can, there are many ways there can be covert means which of course we are not using there can be many such means which we can use to make sure that the pakistanis are under pressure now talk with pakistan there is a lot of suggestions that we must talk to pakistan yes we must talk to pakistan as a matter of fact we have been talking to pakistan ever since 1947 as a matter of fact there were many attempts on peace resolution starting from and this i have mentioned in the book in great detail starting from the time of ayub and nehru then rajgopal achari was also there root in his time then uh, pandit nehru uh, uh, i beg you upon uh, sheikh abdullah was also sent by pandit nehru to pakistan to invite uh, mr ayub khan to india and uh, marshal ayub khan to india and so that they could discuss some way to resolve this problem unfortunately pandit nehru died in 64 and this didn't proceed further but then subsequently in musharraf time musharraf and bajpai musharraf and dr manmohan singh all this went on but all fizzled out because of various reasons so there have been talks but our conditionality is very simple talk and terror cannot go together 
earlier we used to talk to them even when the terrorism was going on but now india is very clear that talk and terror will not go down together and when pakistan is giving you the excuse that they are also infected by insurgency we must tell them that it is a hoax and we do not accept it because they are causing terror in our state what is happening in their own part of the area is their own doing so we can now pakistan has come out with a paper on national security policy uh, which again is a hoax because they talk of friendship with india for 100 years but they talk of kashmir problem to be settled in their own way and also a large part of this paper is a uh, restrict confidential and secret so we don't know what is in that so with all these things i think uh, the talk with pakistan can take place only when the situation is ideal and it suits us uh the video is gone but just can you hear me all right you are in a video so very much now I'll carry on carry yeah on. please please go please go okay, okay. Uh, then i come to two more important point one is that uh, in last two years some developments have taken place number one is very important is the security paradigm in our vicinity and in our neighborhood uh, china in 2020 april may uh, intruded into the indian territory with two divisions plus with lot of mechanized forces and came and occupied certain areas well occupation may not be a correct word but they came and plonked themselves in certain areas one was the area of dipsan second was the area of galwan then uh, gotha then hot springs and then coming to the pagangso lake and india also reacted very strongly and one must give full credit to the government of india and to the armed forces who did a marvelous work and we also built up the same number very quickly mind you the chinese have to come only along the plateau but indians have to move from the zero altitude of 200 300 feet altitude go right up to 15000 16000 feet and brought in two divisions were and we were been face to face there were some skirmishes one was in galwan and uh, which became quite famous uh, and where the chinese have kept telling lies that they only lost four people but recently from australia somebody took out certain documents and videos to show as to how many of the chinese soldiers fell into the galwan river and uh the shok river and they were washed away so over 40 is the number which is estimated and uh, that the chinese a lot of military to military level talks took place uh, but there were no resolution then suddenly on 30th of august 2020 a major development took place indians uh, forces moved special forces moved and occupied five to six very important areas along the kailash range of course kailash range is on our side of the border but it dominates and overlooks the exciting area and these areas were gurung hill magar hill the area of razangla richinla and mukpuri and all these places there had been fight at 62 now this shook the chinese and brought them down to mother earth and they uh, agreed to talk little more sincerely and seriously and finally today only two areas that is the hot spring area where they are still there and which is under discussion and the area of dipsang which is of course dipsang is a bit of a legacy issue is over 10 years uh, that the chinese have been there they have come inside of our area and they are there and our area mean they are about 10 kilometers from the dbo and uh, that is yet to be settled uh, but the point is now china and uh, pakistan in collusion with each other can at any time commence a war or a conflict situation or keep you in this kind of a situation of flux and start an operation in the area of lcs and in connection with each other they are joining and their their operation came on beautifully no fighting a two front war is easier said than done it will be we will 
take it up. Our chiefs are very confident they will be able to handle it. But it is a problem for which what we need to do is spend more money on defense. I'm afraid the budget for defense is refuses to move. It remains more or less the same. And your requirements have risen many fold. And we will have to do a lot of reorganization in the army also, which is being done with a view to increase the number of reserves for the mounted, mounted bed of the LOC and the LST. And of course, the Eastern Sect can also be involved. You do not know as the future threat in being. You cannot trust any of them. And uh, this is my request to all the audience here also, that we must take this point rather seriously. And the only way you can really avoid a war is to be prepared well for a war. Then the other side will not easily take you on. And one thing I'm very sure, India will not give packets, packets because they are not going to win a war. There may be some uh, points lost here and there, uh, both us and them, but there is not going to be any conclusive decision of at war. Uh, but my suggestion would be that with our allies, not allies, but our strategic partners like America and other countries, we must, and Quad, we must come to some kind of an understanding that should a war start, how will they contribute? And that must be done. Like now you see what is happening in Ukraine. The Americans and the NATOs have pushed the Ukrainians into a war. Uh, but now at the right time, they said they will, can, we cannot put any boots on the ground. We don't want boots on the ground for them. But surely from the Navy and the airport, you can expect a lot of help in the Indian Ocean area. Now on to the second point, which is very important. Afghanistan has been unstable for the last two years, and it will take quite some time before they settle down. There's a lot of apprehension in the mind of everybody that Pakistanis will try and use the Al-Qaeda and Taliban insurgents and militants into Kashmir. Now, I must say that, uh, that Kashmir has changed a lot from the time when they started the insurgency in 89. There's a very strong security grid of the army, the RR, and the paramilitary forces, number one. Number two, there is the intelligence, quality of intelligence has risen many fold. Number three, the ecosystem in Kashmir, which supported the insurgency, has also been controlled and wiped out quite uh, substantially. And number four, uh, the Kashmiris have understood that this is going to be a problem, it's not going to be possible. So I don't think that uh, that is going to work out for them at all, and they will not have any success. But one thing I must mention, whereas so far there's no evidence of any Taliban and Al-Qaeda coming into the Kashmir Valley, there is certainly some weapons of the Kish Americans which were left behind in Afghanistan, which have appeared in the Kashmir belt and in the, in the border belt of Kashmir. So this is a statement which was made by GOC uh, of 19 Dev, who is in Baramula about three days back. So one must look at it carefully. But what worries me more, and that is the second point, is that uh, in our hinterland, also they can start a problem. Because they have a lot of sleeper agents, and they can always activate them. And that's where we need to do two things. And uh, they are very important. Number one, the intelligence grid has got to be strengthened. Intelligence has to be of a much, much higher degree. And secondly, and which is the most important point, that in our country, we need to maintain an internal cohesion. That's very important. And I lay an emphasis on the word internal cohesion again. And you all understand that uh, perhaps better than me also as to what is the value of such a thing. And this is the last part of my talk. And that is that India is a democratic country. And we believe in the political system. 
and that's for that reason the earlier a popular government in jnk is the sort the better in this direction when on 24 june and this year rather last year he held a meeting of all the parties of jnk all parties of jnk assembled and he set the right tone he set the right tone uh, when he said ke humko dil se duri aur delhi se duri ko hatana padega aur ek dusre ko samajhna padega and meeting was held in a very cordial environment and what is very surprising is that the uh, article 370 and 35a and it is what is very pleasing also i would say were not the negotiation killers they were not even mentioned and uh, uh, we hope that this thing will progress further and how will that progress the delimitation in the state has been ordered once the delimitation is over it is expected by the month of may and june within 3 months of that we should be in a position to go to uh, go for elections and restore the uh, political government but you got still 5 6 months and this is the time which i feel is very important because uh, because of the covid and perhaps our bureaucracy not being able to keep pace with the requirements we have not been able to fulfill many promises which were made during the prime minister's talk and uh, uh, the development in the state is really not moved very fast and i think there is a requirement and i also mentioned a point of uh, multi ethnic multi religious state and also now how non muslims are feeling very dissatisfied with them not being given the right kind of facilities as compared to the others to make and formulate the system and put them properly so that when the popular government comes into place they have a guideline in front of them which they must follow uh, when they rule and go in the state rule may not be a very good word but go in the state may be a better word that is one so our bureaucracy has got lot to do the governor has got a lot to do i come to the uh, uh, next point and that is the statehood must be restored that was the promise that statehood must be restored only then the kashmiris will get some confidence and whether it is done before the election or after the election that is for the government to decide uh, either way i have no really uh, i can't say with authority uh, anything on this and i think ladies and gentlemen we are headed in the right direction the insurgency will start crumbling in the state when the popular government comes and government of india and the popular government work in cohesion with each other and maybe in next 2 to 3 years you may find the insurgency is getting much and much lower our militancy is getting much and much lower but actually the insurgency or militancy in jnk will perhaps stop or disappear only in 8 to 10 years time or maybe more little more uh, when the pakistan the economic back is broken they are already headed in that direction they are the only country which has set a record have gone to imf 20 times for loans and they cannot sustain themselves long like this even saudi arabia is not even helping them and now they are taking a loan from china so economically pakistan is a non sustainable state so with that happens they will not be able to focus towards keeping the militancy going in jk and to me the last thing is that uh, i think uh, that uh, we have to give the people of jk the confidence our uh, jk and kashmiris especially that they are our people and we love them as much and the final litmus test for the militancy have dis- having disappeared and the peace having res- been restored in jnk would be when you will find that uh, the kashmiris have returned to the valleys now that is a bit of a difficult proposition because the kashmiris who have moved out have now discovered india they find there is much more in india beyond what they perhaps saw in kashmir so that is of course their choice in vivekanand we held a couple of discussions on this i do not know how many will be the takers for that but in principle uh, they 
must be the situation must be created where they can return to their own state and that would be the real uh, happy situation for india and a situation of satisfaction well thank you very much uh, ladies and gentlemen i'm most grateful to you for giving me this uh, opportunity to talk to you now if this there are any questions and answers i will uh, attempt but there are many experts amongst you who are uh, sitting here i see mr abibulla also dr mehta also mr sizodia is working there many amongst you many others who know so i perhaps would like to learn more from your uh, points views and your views and comments uh, rather than my only by talking so thank you very much once again jai hello sir we are speaking we are extremely grateful to you for such a nice presentation very enlightening and it was a first hand account of the situation and many suggestions you have given was a very valid and as you said a large number of experts on kashmir and we would like to hear their views as well so now i first invite uh, mr badat habibullah uh, please please kindly enlighten us with your views <laughs> I don't think, Mr. Mehta, that I enlighten you with my views. I should certainly present a viewpoint uh, on based on my own experience of working in J and K. But first of all, may I say uh, thank you to General Vij. General Vij was the last of uh, my father's cadets to rise to the level of army chief, and so his presentation is particularly gratifying to me. and his achievements of course in his career uh, also i see the book uh, the preface to the book is written by my very dear friend dr karan singh who uh, with whom of course i have had occasion to discuss these issues frequently and he has been very hesitant to write about his views on the kashmir issue and therefore it's a compliment to general bitch that he carries this forward by a person a uh, person a uh, resident of jammu and kashmir of the stature of my friend dr karan singh and of course mr mehta you i know so well from my years in the prime minister's office so it's been very interesting to listen to uh, to general vijay i'm afraid that you know, general vijay's work is has taken the kashmir issue in this larger context and is it in the context of india's relations with pakistan my own view has been generally and that is why my book was called my kashmir because i have written that book from an insider's view of how these various conspiracies and developments on inside of pakistan and not that much in the picture from china but certainly yes and in the relationship with the government of india has developed but yes if i can make my comments starting with the conclusion of general vijay's comment and here he and i will be unanimous in our conclusion that unless we can get the people of kashmir to believe to look upon themselves as indians like we like all of us are we are not going to be able to to bring bring an end to this disaffection i wouldn't even call it insurgency but this this sense of disaffection even if the, if the insurgency is overcome as i hope it will shortly enough but the sense of disaffection if that persists then our whole concept of nationhood which general is brought about so elaborately in his description of what we have been fighting for in kashmir then that remains a threat and therefore this has a lot to do with india's relations with pakistan in a slightly different context you know which is of course in detail explained the actual military and political relations as have developed since the time that pakistan emerged as a nation but my problem lies with the fact that pakistan developed as a nation at all and as general has been clearly pointed out they themselves have never been able to come to a 
to an understanding of what they are as a separate nation because of partition, was an artificial imposition on our country. And this is where I start. Partition was a misconceived idea. And the general, of course, has described how the Muslim League brought it about. But then the Muslim League was simply an instrument in bringing about partition. The question of our being two separate nations because a certain part of our nation had Muslim majority and a certain part of our nation had a Hindu majority. is an artificial concept contradicted over thousands of years of Indian history. It was a concept that, be, that was nourished and became a mature only under post-colonial before that you never find. And you never find this kind of description. I and Mr. Sisodia, as a historian, will tell you that that was never how India was described. Even in Mughal times, when you had a Muslim emperor as, a, as the ruler, you had the bulk of the ruling class who were all of Indian origin. Rajputs, Kayas, in fact, the, in our, the state where I am, and no, which was the, which was, which, which was the, the Champion of the first war of independence. Yes, that war of independence was led by a woman and a Muslim who was bigger than herself. But who were her Tandukas who were supporting her? The Belk were Rajput and Pias. So was this, was this Muslim rule or Hindu rule? Was it a Muslim state or a Hindu state? I mean, this, 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 this doesn't run. And therefore, by dividing our nation into two. And you can spend time spending good maybe four. But my own uh, one who I regard as my brother, this one Singh has written this book on Muhammad Ali Jinnah, in which he's talked about the roots of partition and squarely blamed for that. But never, nevertheless, that's another subject of today's discussion. And so I won't hold you up on that. But yes, the point is. That where I won't go into other details because the general has dealt with them with detail regarding the developments that have occurred. What has been our major failure, India's major failure in terms of Kashmir? And this, I consider my own life a failure because I have not succeeded in rectifying this, although I had made it my aim when I actually started working in Kashmir, which was what the general says to make the Kashmiri people who I was working with and among whom I was an administrator feel that they are as much Indian as I am. And what I'm doing for them is not, I'm not working for them because I'm some, somebody who was sent as a, as a delegate from some other country, but because I'm one of them. An Indian, and yes, a Muslim. This I have failed in, but this is a larger failure. As the general himself has mentioned in his book, and again he has mentioned it, I quote it directly, that when Kashmir became, in, when, when India attained its independence and Kashmir became a part of India by the instrument of accession, which is spoken of, and of course the Kashmir was not part of the merger, and this has been mentioned by Dr. Karan Singh in his foreword, which merged all the other states into India, instead there was an Article 370. But as the general has rightly pointed out Article 370 was a temporary provision because at that point it was conceded that this territory was disputed as before the UN and so on and so forth. Now, I didn't go into details of why it should have gone or whatever. But the fact is that in the Indian army was welcomed by the Kashmiris. The, the Kashmiris were led by Sheikh Abdullah, who was leader of the National Conference. And the National Conference was the largest political party in the whole of Jammu and Kashmir. And the Maharaja had been reaching out. The Maharaja Prime Minister, Ram Chandra Kak, had called on Sheikh Abdullah to support the Maharaja in seeking independence. And Sheikh Abdullah had turned him down. So what happened? This is a much larger question. 
which affected large numbers of, of, of post-colonial governments, including Afghanistan and in general has mentioned Afghanistan. What happened in Afghanistan? What happened in the Northwest frontier? The Northwest frontier was divided from, from Afghanistan by the Durand Line. The Northwest frontier legally, and this has been brought out by my friend Rajiv Dogra of the Indian Foreign Service in his work, Durand's Curse. Northwest frontier to the administration of, the Brit of British India for the sake of the Amir of Afghanistan. And therefore, when India became independent, legally, the Northwest frontier should have gone to Afghanistan. And that is what the frontier Gandhi stood for, an independent Northwest frontier, Afghanistan, for which he suffered. And he felt betrayed because the Indian government did not support that. But because there was a sense of nationalism which drew the Northwest Frontier and Pakistan was having problems with the Northwest Frontier. It drew the Northwest Frontier towards, towards Afghanistan. Therefore, the idea of radicalization, Muslim before Afghan, was mooted by the Pakistani leadership. We know that Muhammad Ali did not always use religion for political purposes, he was not a religious man himself. And this is what comes out clearly from Rajiv Dobra's book, the invasion of Jammu and Kashmir by the Pakistani tribals. The objective was not to win Jammu and Kashmir over for themselves. The objective was to give the Afghans the feeling that they were fighting for their religion. And here was the Muslim state now being occupied by a Hindu country, and therefore the tribals had to go to their assistance in order to buttress, to strengthen their claim of on the Northwest frontier as being part of a Muslim state. The fact that we conceded, and let us not betray ourselves, had we not conceded the idea of Pakistan, it would have been created. Mahatma Gandhi resisted the idea of partition. The rest of the Congress leadership did not. Sadar Vallabhai Patel was in correspondence with the Maharaja, yes. But he, he urged him to opt for either one or the other state. Why? Because both the Indian leadership and the Pakistani leadership were terrified that if these, if these kingdoms started opting for independence or freedom or whatever, it would become a great problem for India and for Pakistan to create them. So therefore, there was this great, fear, this great controversy regarding Swat and the controversy regarding Jammu and Kashmir, which contiguous both to India and to Pakistan, which had a Muslim majority. Yet, the people, the majority of Muslims of Kashmir supported the idea of Sheikh Abdullah, that it should be part of India. And India came to the rescue militarily. But at that time, it was also clear that Sheikh was fighting for his, he identified himself more as a Kashmiri than as a Muslim. And why do I say that? In Jammu, there were the most bloody communal riots and hardly a word of protest by Sheikh Abdullah who aspired to become the Prime Minister, then the Prime Minister of the State of Jammu and Kashmir. Yet, the same Sheikh Abdullah ensured that there was no such attack on the non-Kashmiri, and the non-Kashmiri Muslim means, means the Kashmiri Pandit or the Sikh, who were very small, little minorities during that with the result that Mahatma Gandhi called it a ray of hope. Now, this is how it started. What has happened now, and the general has mentioned in his book, I'll read it, in fact, I'll read it out. That
This is in page 301. The that Kashmiris have moved into radicalization. This is our failure. But this failure has from our own failure at the national level. Mind you, if we are, I'm saying the Kashmiris don't regard themselves in people. There has to be a people-to-people -people understanding. And I'm afraid I don't agree with General Veitch. Setting up a commission at the government of India level with representatives on it from different parts of India is going to help at all. Well, we are, as you've mentioned, General Mok, there's certain responsibilities on government. There are certain responsibilities on us, the people. We have to reach out. We have to reach out to them and make them feel one of us. What is the situation now, today? The situation now, today, is that there is not a single Kashmiri, including those that you feel to now be forming the government, who continue, who feel themselves to be treated as Indians. I'm in touch with all of them. The political leader. You mentioned, General, about the meeting with the Prime Minister. You say it was very cordial. Not even one of those, including Sajjad Noon, who is a very big friend of mine, felt the meeting was cordial at all. Those who were participating in the meeting. So here, this is where we have to move forward. You talked about the way forward, that is your last chapter. But then, fortunately, in discussion with today, you will be able to elaborate on that. The fact is, as you have conceded, that the Davidson Peninsula, which, according to the LAC, signed with China, is part of Indian territory and the Garvin Valley, part of Indian territory under the LAC, are under the occupation, and I don't have any hesitation in using that word. They are under the occupation of the PLA. And that, as you know, Dolat Beg Oldi, access to Dolat Beg Oldi is through the Lepsang Peninsula. And Dolat Beg Oldi controls access to Aksaichin an area for which we have fought. Now, the best way to secure our security, the army has done a great job so far as and I've worked, as you know, very closely with the army, from Pony to the insurgency and all that, over the siege of Hazrat Bal and whatever. But this is not a military problem. The army has had its operation said Bhav, but that has created goodwill for the army, yes. But has it made the people feel more Indian? No. And the people have to be made to feel more Indian if they are going to be asked to stand up against a possible two-front war. That is vital. And I have no dispute with you on this kind of threat emerging. Collusion between India and Pakistan. Pakistan, as you say, is economically in a crisis. But who is their savior? Millions of dollars worth projects, ports, whole ports, highways. You, you, you go across to Pakistan, you see what the investment is. Great, this great road that runs from Karachi right up to the north. All that being financed, they're becoming 
age dependent. I don't think that they, I would agree with you that there is economic being broken. What is happening is that they're being purchased by China. Sorry to use that lunch word. But they are becoming a few, uh, 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 an adjunct of China, a subject state. And they're allowing themselves to become that. But so far as we are concerned, unless we have the Kashmiris feeling that they have something to lose if India goes to war with these two countries, who is there? Are we going to rely on military strength alone and the confidence that we have on our military? Or are we putting too much pressure on our military? Isn't it the duty of the citizens to stand behind the military? I've always been taught, being the son of a general. An army cannot function without its Particularly in army of a democratic country like the world. The fact that it can rely on its people is the strength of the military in such a country. Because in, in other countries which may have professional armies, the army is functioning in its own grid, people somewhere else. That is the weakness, perhaps, of the Chinese army. But should never become a weakness of ours and isn't a weakness of ours in any other part of the country. Unfortunately, in Kashmir, it is there. But those are this particular point. But uh, thank you, General Bridge, for having written this book because it fills a major gap. The stand of our country, of India, with regard to the issue, has been clearly delineated by you. And for that, you deserve every call. Thank you. My alternative general also said we must build the hearts and minds of the people. You also emphasize that maybe in more detail. So thank you very much. And this is the whole idea of this debate discussion. And we have diverse viewpoints brought together. Thank you very much. May I now request Mr. Dutti? Mr. Jutsi, are you there? He's there. He there? Mr. Jutsi, born and brought up in Kashmir, so we know the ground realities. And it's worked in Rajasthan with their friend. Uh, Mr. Jutsi, would you kindly make your comments? Mr. Jutsi, unmute yourself. Ah. So you need to unmute. Am I audible now? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Thank you, dear. Invite me to make my comments. I will be brief, uh, but first of all, I must thank uh, I must thank General Gibbs for his book, which is a very comprehensive account of uh, issues involved in Jammu and Kashmir. Okay, the issues involved okay. in the moment. Uh, you know, there are two, ex two factors in this. One is the external factor, and the other is the internal factor. Both have been dealt with at length uh, by General Wiz and Vajat also mentioned a few of them. My basic points is How are we going to win the hearts and minds of Kashmiris as of today? One can make a lot of comment on what happened recently or uh, the, uh, the scrapping of 370 and 35A. Let us take that as given. What is it that has, needs to be done? In that direction, I don't see there much happening at the moment. As was mentioned by General Wills, the Prime Minister made took an initiative and invited uh, uh, the mainstream political leaders of mainstream political parties in Kashmir, but nothing has happened after that. 
and all the moves that are being made by government of india even today are not being seen as friendly by the by, by the people in the valley take for instance the latest issue of the the delimitation dimming delimitation is being the, the, the current the, what is being available on the press on delimitation is being seen as not being in the interest of kashmiris i'm talking of the people of valley not the people of jammu and kashmir so therefore the issue is what is we what we need to do to win the hearts and minds of kashmiris which is very important if we have to settle this issue even in the interim because final settlement cannot take place unless we have some kind of a modus vivendi with pakistan and that modus vivendi doesn't seem to be in the offing at the government so i think we have to we have to see how, how what we can do to win the hearts and minds of the people of kashmir to convince them that india is not out to grab them as a territory but they are interested in, in them as as a people as a people of kashmir and well. so that is my that is the point i want to make thank you over to you dear sir those now, now may i invite uh, uh, shri gopal sharma who is the ex dgp of jammu and kashmir Again, Thank you. The full knowledge of ground realities and the, the action of the people and all sorts of things. Please, Mr. Sharma. Mr. Sharma. Is he there? Or is he un not unmuted? Sharma. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Am I clear now? No, Thank no, you no, very no. much. Thank you. Now it's very yeah, nice. Uh, okay. Uh, clear now. Is the audio coming? Okay. Thank you very much. Now the crux is. the external dimensions we know the internal dynamics have been well examined by the rich the question is how do we move forward and that is the battle for the hearts and minds of people one is the physical aspect which is infrastructure a lot of it has been done but i must say the road that i traveled to jnk in 1974 still is the same most of it here but still not very well affordable when it rains or snows same for electricity light connectivity is better but there is no train service so unless we physically connect kashmir to rest of india that if we really can start on the next day i think Uh, that he would feel that he's traveling, living in the same country. Then things are not in isolation. Maybe they were there about forty years back, but now anyone sees something in Nataka, and he travels to Kashmir. How can he not be affected by by what is happening in the rest of the country? I think. we need to think the country has to think as to how to assimilate them assimilate them emotionally physically we are trying the government has tried quite a lot the development has started maybe to to improve further but as a nation we have to think of an inclusive attitude towards the kashmiris don't think kashmir as a piece of land but as a place where quite a sizable number of indians live we as a nation have done a lot but i think as individuals we have to stop discriminating uh, in our minds that the kashmiris are different from indians they are indians 
as much Indians as Rajasthanis. And I'm sure these kind of discussions would lead to some kind of modus vivendi where we can maybe divide certain attention, have cross-state interaction. The army has done quite a lot. The JNK police has also done sending people from Kashmir to various parts of uh, India. We have brought out children. The army has brought out uh, hajis and other parts of the society to the rest of the country. But these are minor things. I think we need a greater exchange of people. And that is through possibly by the tourism. If the situation improves, if the infrastructure improves and the tourism flows, grows, perhaps things would improve. Thank you very much. Mr. Suresh Mehta, he was a very senior officer in IB. And I remember he lived in Kashmir for years and I enjoyed his hospitality a long time back. He was a young officer and so was I. So I invite him, Mr. Suresh Mehta, please. Are you there? Unmute yourself. Unmute, Karesara. Unmute, unmute. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes, loud. Yes. Loud and clear. Thank you, dear sir. Uh, at the outset, let me say that almost 15 years of association with the Kashmir affairs in the IB, including my posting in Srinagar for about five years. And subsequently, my interest as a student of Kashmir affairs, uh, I really enjoyed reading General Wiz's book, Kashmir Conundrum, because I found that there were a lot of things that were written were familiar. They were very interesting. Uh, very useful suggestions and uh, I would say fascinating. Uh, he has covered full gamma JNK affairs, I would say JNK problem uh, and therefore I need not reiterate rest, most of it. But I have a few points to make. Uh, with regard to the situation as it exists today. As somebody mentioned that there are two dimensions to the problem. One is internal and the other is external. Uh, I take the sec second one first. And external problem to my mind is mainly related to Pakistan. Uh, for the last 70 years, ever since the partition of the country, 75 years. For Pakistan, it has been a, they call it unfinished agenda or whatever they call the jugular vein of uh, Pakistan. But the fact is that ever since 47, 48, Pakistan has been in an aggressive mood, in a very gerent mood. And I need not go over the uh, four wars that we have fought or what we have been facing, as General Will mentioned in his book, last 30 years of insurgency, militancy, terrorism. Whether Kashmir is a railing point for Pakistan nationalism, whether it is a, a whether it is a, uh, the idea of keeping India down, whether it is the reason that for the Pakistan army, which is quite a powerful uh, force there, the relations of India-Pakistan hinge around broadly Kashmir. To think of Pakistan relenting its efforts to create problem in Kashmir 
even through proxy war or through militancy. I think at this moment, at least I for one think that they will not give up this sort of a strategy. And we have to be prepared for that. A lot of measures have already been taken. The General Wizard mentioned in his book also that you have the uniform command. I'm talking of only at the moment with regard to fighting the militancy sponsored by Pakistan. You have a unified uh, command, you have multi led security grid, you have technical infiltration routes uh, secured, and uh, you have a perhaps, perhaps, Mr. Jussi may not agree, but you have the responsive administration now, and we have uh, started the process of political process in the JNK state. Uh, that is fine. And I think for a period of time, we'll have to see whether these measures work. But I, for one, believe that we are not going to see the end of Pakistan-sponsored uh, militancy or terrorism for a course to come. That's point number one. Point number two, I would say is that Undoubtedly, the Kashmiri population has grievances. Their sentiments have been hurt. They, they, without exception, I would say, un, unexceptionally, I would say that people, the, the minds and hearts of the people of Kashmir have to be one. Now, it's a long process. And uh, what is important in for the government of India is apart from the fact that they abrogated article, we have abrogated article 370 and 35A, which in a sense is, in my view, uh, highly desirable because it ends a certain uncertainty. It ends the uncertainty of Kashmiri JNK being a part of the country. But the point is that the feelings of the Kashmiri population have been hurt. Uh, for apart from the fact that the, uh, these articles have been abrogated, which was in a sense, uh, if you see the uh, political parties in Kashmir, for them, autonomy was, uh, was one of the uh, major points of their political, political philosophy. And I think that of course has now come to an end and it has lost its relevance. But nevertheless, the fact is that people of Kashmir are alienated. There is, un, un, there is no denying of this fact. And for, for the hearts and minds of the people of Kashmir, which I think is a long process, we'll have to take some very, very firm and uh, long-term measures. Uh, Kashmiri population has to wish. It has been repeatedly mentioned that they are part, they are as much Indians as any other uh, person from the rest of the states. But that calls for a long term strategy, uh, and we must concentrate on that. Another point that I like to mention, which is not been discussed, and I think when there is a passing reference in General Vijay's book, that this is with regard to. Uh, the little talked about issue of Bakarwals and Ujas. They constitute about 10% of the population, more than 10% of the population of the state. But I think because the problem has been totally Kashmir centric, and therefore this, uh, they have been ignored in, in the, in the last so many decades. And Bakrawals and Gujars and Gadis and Pahadis are the population which are quite well disposed towards India. They deserve to get better political representation. Uh, I believe that the Delimitation Commission is 
but I'm going to recommend reservation of seats for them. But apart from the reservation of the seats, there is a need for giving them economic and social support so that these nomad, nomadic tribes are able to realize that they are also very much part of the state and they have a role to play in that. Uh, having said that, on the political front, of course, uh, after the abrogation of Article 370 and 35A, uh, there have been some measures to reach at the grassroots level by, by way of holding elections in the panchayat blocks and subsequently in the district level and all this. But I think a, an important aspect of uh, bringing about a sort of a political aspirations of the people uh, to fru fru fruition it is important to hold the elections at the state level. One more measure that I would suggest is that, of course, it is all in the pipeline and therefore it is known that the degradation, or shall I say, bringing a notch lower than the normal state in India, this union territory, making Jammu and Kashmir a union territory, I think the sooner we do away with this, the better it is. Because that gives the feeling to particularly Kashmiris that they, they are not being treated in, in the same level as the other states. Uh, I would therefore suggest that the elections to the assembly as also of the uh, evolution of union territory to regular and bringing the Jammu and Kashmir as a regular state is important. And last but not the least, uh, it is very important that we create an atmosphere in the state, particularly in the way, really, which becomes conducive for Kashmiri Pandits who have been uh, thrown out of the state, of, of the valley, to come back to the state and rehabilitate. And we should ensure that there is a rehabilitation of the Kashmiri Pandits back in the Kashmir Valley. And these are some of the points. In fact, there is a lot more to discuss, but I would uh, confine myself at the moment to these points that I have raised. And uh, uh, thank you, General Luis, for a very fascinating, elaborate um, book that I've read carefully and also heard you talk about it uh, in your uh, discourse. Thank you very much. You made one very interesting point, which covers almost 10% of the population, Bakarwals, etc. Uh, nobody thought of this or wrote about it. Uh, thank you very much. Otherwise, of course, you, many of the points have to be in the hearts and minds of the people. Everybody is struggling with that. Now I invite Emil Kumavad. He was um, the uh, uh, ex DG of BSF and SS Home, Special Secretary Home in the Ministry of Government, Home Ministry Government of India. And he's also very well versed in the problems. Thank you. Please. What's up? Thank you, sir. Uh, first of all, I congratulate General Wedge, who has authored this excellent book on Kashmir. And uh, I'm really privileged to have been his course mate 30 years ago in National Defense College. And uh, he's a good human being and I cherish his friendship. Now about Kashmir, I think the running thread in the discussion that we have been having for last two hours is how to win hearts and minds of the people of Kashmir. Um, I'm also a student of Kashmir and I now have family relationship in Kashmir, Kashmiri. Uh, Kashmir is, uh, I visit every year, in fact, but I feel and read, you know, Kashmir Times daily, besides, you know, what happens in the mainland. Do people of India, as other mainland, do they appreciate, understand, you know, the people of Kashmir? I think hardly. You generally, they, whenever I talk to people here in Jaipur or elsewhere, uh, they generally talk of 370 and like that, but they do not know what Kashmiris have undergone in last 75 years. 
in fact kashmir would not have been part of india if kashmiris would not have been with us kashmir would not have been part of india if uh, sheikh abdullah would not have been with us because people his leadership in fact was the leadership that counted at that point of time but what happens now general we talked of uh, you know that uh, we should love kashmiris but generally what we find people of india they love more the land and uh, do not understand i will say the people of kashmir because uh, they do not know in fact i have some facts and figures where very people i think may be aware last republic day 189 gallantry medals were awarded to police officers from all over india and of them 115 were given to jnk police they are as loyal or rather more loyal than you know uh, many other parts of people and just imagine only 10 medals gallantry medal went to chatisgarh and seven to maharashtra what i want to say the problem of terrorism is being handled by kashmiri officers and policemen and most of them are muslims so i think why people doubt their loyalty we should make them feel that they are our people but for them the five wars that india has fought i think every war kashmir has been affected and general which book i have gone through in fact he has also mentioned that without their help i think we would have not got kashmir even 1948 itself they would have reached kashmir but they fought they almost physically fought with them and same thing was in Kar- kargil also we got information from kashmiris also and every war so this is one thing i think we need to understand but the statements which are vitriolic poisonous very um, they, which hurt in fact other day only one bihar mla had said that uh muslim should be made the uh, second rate citizen they uh, voting rights should be taken away dharm sansad what has spoken you know that we take up arms against uh, minorities all these things are they appear in kashmiri papers also kashmiris read these uh, what actually people talk here so i think people need to be very sensitive when they uh, you know they attack uh, fellow citizens because we have to uh, create a nation you know build a nation make this nation is stronger than what it is today but this uh, seems not happening and uh, finally i'll just say uh, general bij has said when the situation will be considered to have improved he has given two points that when 6 to 8 million tourists will visit kashmir and that to excluding amarnath pilgrims again i give some facts last year 6 lakh people up visited kashmir and his uh, my figure is 60 to 80 lakhs so i think uh, Kash- delhi abhi bhi bahut dur hai 60 to 80 lakhs and second he says then when kashmiris uh, pandits would have gone back uh, to kashmir here i have a different view point because i told you i have kashmiri pandit my daughter in law in my house i ask you know them they will never go back they want to have their land back is one thing but it is second generation third generation third generation are they are studying here second generation are well employed here first generation who came over 40 50 years age they have died also they have very little connection and they are very well employed in uh, mainland and even uh, elsewhere in the world also i don't think they will go back and settle in kashmir i may be i mean contradicted in case i am wrong you know but they will not go back they would like to have their land is one thing but whether they will all kashmiri pandits 4 lakh will go and settle in kashmir i differ with uh, uh, other you know speakers in case they have said so so this is what i want to say we should win hearts and minds of people and we should make them feel that they are much uh, because kashmiris have suffered as i uh, i would like to mention that since independence and especially after their militancy 1989 50000 kashmiris died 50000 nowhere in the world nowhere in the country no state has suffered as much as kashmir has suffered 50000 tell me i work in andhra pradesh in kashmir you know this next right violence also not 50000 in one particular state 50000 people have died and majority of them are civilians next comes you know militants death of militants and third comes security forces of course security forces have kept you know kashmir as part, integral part of india but finally only when the people of kashmir 
are behind security forces only i think country will be uh, very strong and kashmir will be uh, in the hearts and minds of people of india and vice versa thank you very much uh, general wedge and uh, dr mehta sir thank you sir shri ashok bhandari again is a very distinguished officer ex special secretary of the home ministry dealing with kashmir but i saw अशोक भंडारी साहब आर यू अवेलेबल थैंक यू वेरी मच डी आर मेहता साहब एंड गुड गुड आफ्टरनून जनरल विज आई डोंट नो आई रिमेंबर यू बट यू रिमेंबर मी और नॉट बट आई एम कॉरेस्पॉन्ड आई आई एम of the same period when you were the cnc i have attended meetings in your office as special secretary home kashmir affairs uh dear mehta saab uh, i think so much has been said about the book and the problems of kashmir that i would not like to take everyone else's uh, valuable time over it uh, but i would only like to recall that as special secretary kashmir uh i was once invited by shri dr mehta at uh, the residence ashoka road residence of uh, shri giridhari lal bhargav the then mp from rajasthan where dr mehta saab had organized a prophylactic feat for uh, you know those who had left uh, lost their uh, foot uh you know people from rajori and punch and uh, dr mata saab had provided that jaipur foot uh, to them and the people of rajori and uh, punch were very grateful to them to to him for it now that is the sort of activity of uh, uh, bridging the relationship between kashmir and the rest of india is required and i think politically Uh, it has been a seesaw sort of a battle but uh, uh, you know winning hearts and minds is the really uh, uh, the way of uh, achieving what we want to achieve in kashmir uh, now i have one more thing to say and that is that uh, luckily the period that i spent in the home ministry was the period when atal bihari bajpayee ji was the prime minister of india and i think that was i i am a witness to the speech of kashmiriyat insaniyat and zamuriyat uh, 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 you know simile that he had given and uh, that was the period when uh, dr abdul kalam was the president of india and uh, you know uh, he once proposed to visit kashmir and he called me up along with my joint secretary who again happens to be uh late shri rakesh huja he was the joint secretary kashmir affairs when i was special secretary and uh, uh dr abdul kalam said uh, that if i go to kashmir i must uh, you know understand kashmir so we had two or three sessions you know he he was a person who had his heart at his right place and he said ashok ji tell me what is the message that i can take which will make kashmiris feel good and he thought of the dependence of the militants you know the men folk get killed but the widows of the militants and the children of the militants nobody looks after them and this is what uh, dr abdul kalam uh, thought he would like to say something to them or to do something for them uh, now that is the sort of approach which is required uh to win the hearts and minds of the people dr mehta saab's efforts dr abdul abdul you know dr abdul kalam never went to never went to kashmir but he was getting ready to go for some reasons he couldn't go but this is what he asked me that give me tell me something that i can do for the video widows of the militants who get killed there and the children of the militants nobody looks after them so uh i think uh, the meeting has gone on for 2 uh, hours now 
uh, and people are losing their patience also. And I really don't have anything to add. I am very lucky that I had two students uh, with Kashmir. I was a member of the BSF. I was uh, IG at Jodhpur. But 12 of my battalions were on internal security duty in Kashmir. So I had to visit Kashmir every year. And I went during that period thrice. And uh, uh, after that, I got uh, somehow appointed Special Secretary Kashmir Affairs. My wife and I have gone to Kashmir 29 times. That is something uh, that I count as a record. Uh, but and, and we feel famished that in the last few years, we haven't been able to go. Uh, uh, I have best of friends in Kashmir. And uh, uh, really, winning the hearts and minds is the answer to the problem. Thank you very much, dear Mehta Saab and uh, Naren Singh Ji, Sisodia, for giving me this chance. There are experts. I am really no expert. It's just a chance that I got posted to Kashmir uh, Affairs. Uh, no, last but not the least, you know, uh, Guru Bachan Jagat, a batchmate of mine, uh, he was appointed DG BSF uh, Kashmir. Now, during that, no, DG Kashmir, DG Kashmir. And during that period, uh, I happened to go to Kashmir once and uh, I asked him, the, what is the best thing that you are trying to do? He said, I am trying to reestablish the police station. Because there was a time when nobody went to police station. The police stations were uh, fitted with a company or two of um, uh, uh, Rashtriya Rifle or paramilitary forces. Uh, no FIRs were being written. Unless the civilian system is established, uh, Jagat said, uh, winning the hearts and minds is a pipe dream. So uh, till the civic civil administration established, till, till people feel that the aim of the administration is to bring a real peace and not just firefighting, uh, uh, things can't be achieved. Well, these are my reflections. I am no expert. Uh, I can only talk of uh, what I saw in Kashmir uh, and experienced. I uh, pay my uh, homage to Atal Bihari Ji Bajpai and Dr. Abdul Kalam on this occasion. And uh, thank you very much, uh, dear Mehta Saab, for gifting me this book. Yes, no, but uh, uh, you know, Pragya Bharti is the one which gives the gift. <laughs> So I must thank you and thank you very much for this opportunity to speak about. Uh, thank you very much for your reflection and your thank uh, you, sir. examples of humanity in action. Thank you very much. Uh, now may I invite Chief Jayas Bins. He was um, again in IB and worked in Kashmir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I come straight to the point because it's lunchtime. So I think we should not pin too much uh, on Pakistan's economy going bad and Pakistan having a difficult time. I think uh, we have, there were occasions earlier when Pakistan had economic difficulties, but it got through. And it will uh, not dilute its effort to create problems in Kashmir or for that matter in mainland India. And a weak Pakistan or a failed Pakistan will become a state Pakistan and that will not serve our purpose. If for a moment we assume that Pakistan collapses overnight, I think we'll have lakhs and lakhs of Pakistanis coming into India as refugees. So we should not uh, look for a Pakistan that is a failed state. And you do not have anybody to negotiate with in case you want to have a talk. So Pakistan should remain intact for the future of Kashmir. Of course, we have to tackle Pakistan. And uh, I think when I look back on my days in Kashmir, that every time you spoke to a Kashmiri, he would like to compare the infrastructure of Kashmir, POK, and India. And if you spoke to people coming from POK, whether they were militants or other citizens, they would also compare this infrastructure. General Ridge has very appropriately contained some pages in his book comparing the infrastructure in POK and in India. So if we want Kashmiris to not look at Pakistan 
and only look at mainland India to uh, be with us, then we have to strengthen mainland India. And mainland India has to become a paradise for that paradise to be connected with this paradise. In other words, if mainland India does not have fault lines, if we put our house on, then Pakistan will also remain in check and we will have won the hearts and minds of the people of Kashmir. Now, General Vinge has been at pains to say that in order to give good administration to, Pakistan, to Kashmiri, in order to win over their hearts, we should have excellent administration. Everything should be working perfect. Everything should be all right, at least. And we should be able to give them good administration. I think this is also required, not only for Kashmir, this is required for the entire country. Now, Kashmiris, if we want them to look up to us, then we should be very, very good in whatever we do, especially the route that I suggest is the economic route. We may have a number of other fault lines, but if we do economically very well, then I think uh, Pakistan will also understand and it will be left out on uh, socio-economic parameters as compared to us, and we would have won the hearts and minds of the people. I am quite convinced that we should revive the political process as soon as possible. And when we revive it, it should be a very healthy political process. I am emphasizing the word healthy because if we do not have a healthy political process, then we would not be able to dilute the radicalization that is happening among the youth today. We may prevent infiltration. We may prevent Pakistan from sending arms and ammunition. But if we cannot uh, check radicalization, there will be a difficult time for us. And as has been pointed out that already weapons of the Taliban are in GNK, uh, I think uh, we should be careful. The Taliban is free these days. And uh, they are committed also. There are mercenaries also. So at the bidding of Pakistan or the ISI or any other uh, militant group, uh, they can infiltrate to whatever extent they can, and they might find alternative routes also to come apart from the LOC. So ultimately, what I have to say is that we have to put uh, our entire system, we have to gear up our system, not only in GNK, but also in mainland India, so that the Kashmiri can legitimately look up to what is happening in India and be satisfied that this is where his future lies. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I hope that was audible, sir. Yes, you are. Sir. Thank you, sir. That's all, sir. Thank you, 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 sir. Thank you. Uh, yes, yes. We are already, already, already quite late, and uh, uh, I think we should be. We heard uh, very keenly the, uh, the excellent presentation by General Vij and the very learned observations by people who have worked in Kashmir or have lived in Kashmir. I have done neither. I have not worked there nor lived in Kashmir, but I am an ordinary Indian who has been looking at the Kashmir issues from a distance and have some Kashmiri friends. Based on that, I'll just, I'll not be very long in my saying, just two, three or four questions which come to my mind as an Indian on what has been happening in Kashmir. I'll just raise these points and then we can all keep on pondering over those issues. Uh, one is that everybody has been saying about the management of perception. And I agree with that because perception is something which it becomes sometimes more important than the reality. But actions will have to be there to change that perception. Our words cannot change the perception. Uh, on 5th of August, when this was declared a union territory and the statehood was withdrawn, I think for months together, the internet was cut off. The, all other communication lines were cut off. The, the movement was restricted. So how do we want, how do we make people of Kashmir feel that yes, that we trust them? Uh, if we trust them, we have to prove that they are trustworthy and we have to really show that trust in our actions. That is one thing. Uh, one more thing, which uh, general, which belongs to Kash, uh, Jammu part that he has said, I was just th theoretically thinking in myself that if he had been born in the valley part of Kashmir, 
uh, would his perception about the Kashmir situation now would have been the same or would have been slightly different? Uh, that is something which is theoretical, but uh, if uh, one can uh, say something about it. And lastly, uh, I, I think the uh, abrogation of 370, etc. has been done. It is a done thing now. But so Supreme Court has also been sitting over this issue for uh, many, many yeah, it is more than a, a couple of years. So had the Supreme Court taken it in time, uh, would there have been a change constitutionally because uh, the Supreme Court has not even taken up the hearing of this matter? Would, there, would that have um, uh, brought some change in the situation uh, somewhere? Uh, lastly, I think we need to uh, trust Kashmiris through our actions. We need to show to them through our behavior and actions with them. We don't need to treat Kashmiris, every Kashmiri with suspicion. As somebody said, Mr. Kumar said very rightly, that the families, even today, the families of the militants are being almost labeled as the militants and they are also uh, treated accordingly. What has the family done? If somebody has become a militant to win over the hearts and of those people, we need to be slightly more compassionate towards them. And I think compassion is something and the equal treatment, equal behavior and, uh, and the proper movement between the uh, other part of the country and the Kashmir will probably bring us to a situation where we feel them as one and they also feel us as part of them. And uh, that, that's what I know with excellent presentation. It has been quite long. Thank you so much, Mehta Sahib, for giving me the book. I had read it. I'll read it once again. So it requires two readings at least to be able to uh, internalize what has been mentioned there. Thank you so thank much, you, sir. Thank, thank you, so you much. very much. Uh, Mr. Sahib, like to say something? Sir, at least uh, I will say thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you to you for giving this book, uh, which I have gone through. Uh, I would also like to compliment General Vich uh, for showing remarkable army brevity in telling us everything in such a concise, logical, and attractive manner, which uh, you know induced us, motivated us to read it and get through the history of Kashmir once again. Thank you very much, General Vich, for a wonderful presentation of the present and past of Kashmir. Uh, I I also particularly liked Vajat's uh, ground reality report. Uh, Vajat uh, is an old colleague and uh, uh, what he said was pouring out of his heart. And to me, that looks like the situation of Kashmir rather than any book. Uh, Sir, I just uh, I have a question for General Wish to answer if you would like to know. Sir, we have gone through the history and geography that you said. Uh, the problem in the country today is everybody are probably is interested in digging the history, digging the graves of what happened, why happened, who did right and who did wrong. And that is a national problem. I think we are not devoting enough time for future. We are devoting majority of time for our past only. And we'll remain buried in the past. Uh, we are depending on Kashmir, a problem to be solved by Pakistan. There's one part of the problem we understand, but I go with Vajat and what Mahinder has said, uh, how much do we know really of Kashmiris? Or do we treat Kashmir as a only paradise on earth, uh, which the gentleman said and has gone to the paradise, a virtual paradise? Uh, if the facts, what Vajat said is correct, then say there are a lot of homework to be done. Uh, everybody is saying this should be done, this should be done, this should be done. I would like to know, sir, how will it be done? And who will do it? Are we depending on army to do it? Are we depending on the political process only to do it? Uh, we were just told there's no roads there. The electricity is still poor there. And we think if they will treat themselves as Indian. Uh, the first question is, uh, do we really treat them as Indians? Or we treat them only a place of tourist luxury where I have been on many times. Uh, I will just say one more incident and then close my issue, sir. Uh, thank you. You are not introduced me as an expert of Kashmir because I am not one. But as an officer of the Indian Army, I have served in Kashmir for five years. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, I should have mentioned that. Otherwise. Sir, I have not written any book yet. Uh, and I have traveled from Poonch, Rajauri, Tangdhar, Baramula, Uri sector, everywhere. My unit has fought there, 1965 war, and we have won that war. Wherever I, our unit fought, we captured the area. The only point I want to make is, uh, whenever we talk to the civilians, and I'm talking of late 60s, when insurgency was not there. Today, insurgency overshadows everything of Kashmir. 
that time when you talk to the people they will respect you because you are in army uniform but i never found that they were talking to you from the heart as one of the citizen of his state or citizen of his town or of his so and so they respected you because you are saving them we respected them because we are they are part of our nation that uh, general viz mentioned a very good phrase in his book kashmiriyat uh, and uh, ashok gave the entire syllabus on that uh, that kashmiriyat we have not been able to respect and that kashmiriyat we have not been able to bring up into them so that they could feel part of the country i want to know from the experts sir how do we do it everybody knows the problem we are looking for the solution uh, dear sir grateful for finding thank you very much uh, finding me eligible to read the book and you presented one to me <laughs> and thanks uh, general vis sir for this beautiful presentation on that god bless thank you very much uh, uh, mr sandeep tripathi you want to raise some question mr tripathi please uh, thank you thank you mr mehta uh, but be kindly be very very please. i am just to very briefly speak just to give my background uh, i am from indian police service uh, bashmit of mr kumawat and uh, gopal sharma and uh, i was in raw for 34 years retired oh. uh, retired as its head and uh, i have seen this problem from all angles i also did a posting in uh, geneva in the indian uh, permanent uh, indian uh, permanent mission to united nations during mid 90s when the question of kashmir was brought in by pakistan in the un human rights commission at that time the indian delegation which came there was led by mr bajpay mr farooq abdullah was also a member of that so this question was very very active uh, uh, in the united nations human rights commission at that point of time and uh, of course i was a part of uh, we all together were uh, successful in thwarting the move of the pakistan you know uh, here i will just uh, make two or three points firstly how kashmir is seen by foreign diplomats from outside what is kashmir problem we have to be we have to understand that and we have to be clear about that and again that whenever any kashmir issue is raised by pakistan or anybody at any international fora what do they mean by uh, kashmir general which has briefly mentioned as its first point that after the signing he mentioned about the signing of instrument of accession and after the signing of instrument of accession the entire erstwhile princely state of kashmir that is the entire princely state and internationally when they attribute the kashmir mean the entire earlier princely state of jnk that is being termed as kashmir and kashmir problem relates to that for them what pakistan has been trying and they have created a narrative there they have created a false narrative that kashmir problem is the human rights issue in kashmir valley they from our point of view it is a security situation from their project is a human rights situation in the kashmir valley so entire narrative on kashmir has been shifted to from a boundary problem between india and pakistan on the erstwhile princely state of jnk part of which is under illegal occupation of pakistan to the situation in the valley and somehow somehow we have fallen in that trap what is kashmir problem basically kashmir problem from international point of view if you see that it is basically after the signing of instrument of accession like with regard to other princely states the entire jammu and kashmir became a part of india pakistan has legally occupied a part of it there also we are not clear we term ajk as pok pok is the part which is illegally occupied by pakistan and it comprises gilgit and baltistan and so called ajk which is actually i will say as gulam jammu and kashmir i don't i don't want to go into detail about what is their constitution and all that i will recommend that recently uh, ambassador dinkar shrivastav has come out with a book called uh, forgotten kashmir in which he has clearly uh, given what is the situation in that side of kashmir 
from our point of view everything we discussed today kashmir meant kashmir valley and adjoining area or at the most uh, earlier indian state of jnk now indian ut of jnk because now ladakh is also we are not treating as as kashmir so valley is very important for us i think we all spoke about you must win their heart and mind we have to bring them closer to the rest of india and as some uh, some of the speakers have also mentioned that is not only i'm good administration not only for valley but for the rest of india also you know similarly things can be said to the people of northeast also they have also to be brought closer to india so those things are there are those measures we need to take but what is kashmir problem as such kashmir problem is basically a border issue between india and pakistan which needs to be resolved kashmir valley situation is our internal situation pakistan i mean we will not involve them there is no question of talking to them they have and they are doing insurgency there as they are doing in the rest of india isi is extremely active in our country and their objective is to create you know our societies as it is fragile and they they create uh, you know division among the people and somehow we tend to fall in their trap so i mean india has to be certainly militarily and economically strong and socially more cohesive no doubt about it but situation in the valley i will say we have to be very clear when we are talking about kashmiri people we should talk people of valley jammu people are also kashmiris in that sense when you use the word kashmir so we have to be very clear when we use word kashmir in what sense are we referring to the valley are we referring to the ut of jnk or are we referring to the erstwhile princely state of jnk now in the valley as uh, some of the speakers have pointed out we have to take lot of confidence building measures those people have to be integrated and their hearts and mind are to be but one thing is very clear that unless and until this interference from pakistan in the valley stops here the problems may continue or likely to continue there may be ups and downs there may be ups and downs in security situation there but situation will not normalize there. whatever we may do unless and until the border issue with pakistan is settled and for settling the border for that i mean we have to take put pressure on pakistan on pok we have to be more more forthcoming in our assertion of our rights to that area we keep quite about it we don't mention it anywhere so these are the things we have to be more assertive about our rights there and then how to sort, sort out these border talks border uh, issues either you go either it could there are only two possibilities either through war or through talks now talking to pakistan again i talking on what the talks to pakistan should be limited to border dispute yes, that how pakistan is going to protect our area yes so these are the things that i will say that uh, we have to be clear about it and of course internally we have to be much more cohesive as uh, many of uh, 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 other speakers have pointed out thank you very much thank you thank you tripathi sir for giving a different dimension international one also the fact that unless pakistan sector continues the problem might continue even in the matter of in hearts and minds of the people to tap ching to do to tap ching you want to raise your hand she to tap ching are you likely to raise a question not available she davi she davi sir sir please be very brief uh i uh, good afternoon to everyone i am also retired defense personnel my view of the problem of jnk is that we have been ingrained in the thought process in the mind from our childhood of a certain type of thinking to solve the kashmir problem with the problem which was there in 1947 we are just working on that principle with don th uh, or those thought process and we are cementing the mistake which we were we have been doing it is still going on we have to think the mistake made by nehru and gandhi indra in 1971 and 1947 and we have to come out from the our 
that mindset, appeasement policies and other things, then only the solution. Because the today new youth is, I have interacted on ground and I found new youth, child coming out from Matrasa is filled with hate against India. When we talk about, they say, you from India, that means we have to control madrasas, the education going on there, the hate is being filled up in the mind of the this community, and we have to really, as a nation, raise the question, what is the meaning of minority? What is minority? Because nowhere the definition has been given minority in constitution, or nothing is being done on this, ki why we are having this minority, are these really minority? And in this appeasement policy, because I was seeing a data some time back, the per capita expenditure of this economic yes, development. My, my request is that that's a separate issue. We can discuss it later. Kindly okay, concentrate sir, on Kashmir. Thank you. I'm saying that Kashmir only. That per capita expenditure on Kashmiri is much more compared to any other state in India. Still, the problem is there. Then we have to really think of out of the blue, like this time 370 has been done in 2019 by the Pratan government. And similarly, solution will be different, not from the traditional way of thinking. If we keep doing it, and solution will then only will come out to right. for this problem. Thank you very Thank much. And that's Kusum Jain. Are you wanting to raise some issue? Sir, that's where my issue was that. No, no, I'm not asking you. Kusum Jain. Kusum. Do you want to raise some issue? No. Friends, first I thank Tamil Sahib for his excellent presentation. You all were enlightened. And interestingly, his perspective also is how to achieve peace. He also talks of, he is not only talking of security issues, he is also talking of winning the hearts and minds of the people. Thank you very much. The debate has been fascinating. Different viewpoints have been presented. Despite the fact that people have been hard boiled, uh, bureaucrats or police officers or army personnel, I mean, there is a realization all through that ultimately the solution to the problem is how to win hearts and minds of the people. Because not many suggestions came forward how to do that, but that is the crux. Some other issues were also raised, but time is, is, uh, is the constraint, and everybody wants us. I raised my hand. I raised my hand. I put a suggestion in the chat box. Thanks a lot. Yeah, please. Give me two minutes, I'll explain that. Yeah, please do that. Hello. Please. Please go ahead. Hello. Okay. My point is that we have all been talking about winning the hearts and minds of the people of Kashmir. A very valid point. But nobody knows how to go about this issue, how to win the hearts or the minds or whatever. And what is the practical solution to this? Now, I feel that apart from all the views which have been mentioned by Mr. Vajahut and others, other experts also, one dimension which has been completely missed out is the total mismanagement and administration in the state by which millions of rupees, billions of rupees, trillions of rupees that have gone into assistance in Kashmir have gone down the jhelum or into the pockets of the privileged few. Now, if that problem can be sorted out, or at least from now on, a clean, corrupt-free administration could be provided. And now we had a very good platform of uh, this Article 370 having been withdrawn and the central government having full say, if we could have a corruption-free development in the state and the results were visible, it would be a straight method of winning the hearts and minds of the people. And for that reason, 
I asked a question in the chat box. What is the progress in development, uh, corruption-free development in this state since 5th of August 2019? That's a very critical issue. We have no clear, clear data on this. The whatever is given out by the government that be correct, partially correct, but nobody believes that. There must be something of conveyance. This is my point. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, many people have mentioned this, and also with the Sharma made. Let's go. Let's think of the future. Just let's not concentrate on the past all the time. We, we, don't, we are not here to do audit of how the money was spent. Anyway, now the last point I have to make is very interestingly, the number of experts that we I have. Said, uh, please, uh, you made your point, please. Uh, the number of experts that you have on Kashmir in, uh, in Jaipur, that number may be next only to the number of experts in Delhi. Amazingly, I mean, so many people served in Kashmir. They can talk so authoritatively on Kashmir. Anyway, let me thank all the panelists also for their enormous uh, comments. Uh, we are all enriched. And my mind, it has been a great debate. I enjoyed it, and I hope you too must have enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> May I uh, now vote a formal vote of thanks to General Vij, uh, Vajahat, all the other distinguished speakers, and especially Mr. D.R. Mehta, uh, who has taken such keen interest in this and also arranged, offered his generous uh, uh, help for uh, distribution of books and taken keen interest all throughout. Uh, no doubt this has been a very rich discussion. We have very good participation. And uh, uh, while the intention was not to find a final solution, but definitely this has greatly <clears throat> enhanced our understanding of the Kashmir issue. Uh, one problem <clears throat> or one complaint that people often have in uh, Jammu and Kashmir is that rest of India does not understand what the Kashmir problem is and doesn't take sufficient interest. This was a point also made by Mr. Kumawat. And I am uh, glad that this, is, this uh, webinar has served to uh, promote greater understanding, uh, giving full uh, uh, range of views. Therefore, we hope that this will lead to some better understanding of the Kashmir issue. And uh, in our own different ways, we would be able to contribute to public discourse on the subject. Thank you very much, General Rich. Thank you all the speakers and thank you, Mr. D.R. Mehta for kindly helping us with this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sodia, and thank you, Dr. Mehta and all members. I think it's been a big education for me to learn to all you people. And, uh, and I think this comment was very rightly made. There are more experts in Jaipur and uh, then perhaps <laughs> anywhere else in India living daily. Daily, everybody is an expert. <laughs> like on every subject. <laughs> <laughs> on, every, on every subject. So I will not, there were a few points which I thought I'll mention, uh, but I will leave them because all those have been mentioned and we all understand the relative importance of them. Uh, but this point about Gujars, uh, the delimitation in the paragraphs which have been written on delimitation, uh, this point has been mentioned in detail. And now the delimitation commission has decided to uh, reserve six seats in Jammu and three in uh, Kashmir for the, this community. So I think that problem will also be taken care of. Of course, hearts and mind remains on the top of the list. And that's where, even though we care, uh, unfortunately, we've not been able to put it across as the Huryad and others have been selling their narrative. Our selling of our narrative is a very weak part. And uh, that's why I said something has to be done on it, whether you make a commission or a committee or whatever you do. But experts have to be put. Army alone, what they did, was okay up to a point, but not beyond that. And lastly, 
my mistake, I think I perhaps not mentioned. I must say that JNK police, SOG especially, and of course all the paramilitary forces have made tremendous sacrifices and contribution uh, in maintaining the security situation in JNK. So thank you very much once again <laughs> for my own education. I have benefited a lot personally. Thanks, sir. I invite you to Jaipur also. Please come here. Physically tell us. Sir, I, I must uh, add that uh, all the facilities for this seminar have been provided by Gita Mittal Foundation and we are especially thankful to Mr. Indrajit Khanna for his support. Thank you all. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.